So, who put the offer on the table? Oh, uh, she did. And the terms were so attractive, I jumped on her. Uh, uh, it. <laughs> I jumped on it. And, uh, don't worry, I protected my investment. <laughs> What was that all about? Carlton lost his virginity. I just wanted to let you know about my study group. Oh, don't be a fuddy duddy. I'll be your study buddy. I'm about to embark on one of the great challenges of my scientific career. This work right here is going to change history. I think this is going to be our greatest mission. I don't have time to study. I'll never get into Stanford. I got big plans for you tonight. I got maps. I got charts. I'm going to see you through this because my credibility is on the line. It's at this point that you'll want to start taking notes. Welcome to the Sitcom Study, the podcast where we investigate the TV shows we grew up with and search for the truth and wisdom within the tropes and cliches. And for our very first episode, we are talking about losing your virginity in the world of TV sitcoms. But before we even get to that, Amy, what is the concept of our podcast? Okay, so the concept is just like TGIF with the four sitcoms. We're going to select a TV show trope and we'll pick four shows um, to watch and see how they deal with that trope. Uh, yeah, the sitcoms that we watched as kids, uh, the primetime or after school reruns or whatever, played a huge part in shaping my worldview. Uh, we will discuss how one of the TV episodes that uh, we watched for this episode probably introduced me to the concept of sex, definitely introduced me to the concept of being a virgin and uh, <laughs> what a condom was. Um, just uh, huge portions of my understanding of life and the world were informed by uh, TV sitcoms. Uh, and so it fascinates me now to go back and see how all of these different shows address these different topics, because it seems like, you know, for some reason they decided they all needed to have something to say about drugs or divorce or whatever it is. And not all of them are that, you know, very special episode-y, right? Some of the tropes that we're going to look at are things as simple as drawing, you know, we're going to divide the room in half, draw a line down the middle of the room or murder mysteries or somebody getting amnesia, you know, things like that. Yes, and of course, there is my personal favorite sitcom storyline, wherein a character gets bopped on the head, completely changing their personality to a different character whose name is basically their name, but sort of pronounced slightly differently. And then uh, the only way to get them to come back is to hit them on the head again. So like you said. Every week, we're going to put together a lineup of four shows, uh, four episodes that all address this certain sort of topic or trope and watch them and uh, just sort of see what they have to say, see how they're similar, how they're different. And for our first episode, we decided to watch uh, TV episodes about losing your virginity because we're losing our podcast virginity tonight Right now. Right now. Pop in the pod cherry. Um, so our episodes that we watched, we did Facts of Life, uh, Head of the Class, Full House, and Fresh Prince. Facts of Life, Season 9, Episode 16, Losing It? Did we confirm? Is that the episode it's called title? The First Time. Uh, the First Time. So before we even get into the sex aspects of this um, or the virginity aspect of it. Yeah, what the hell? All right, so let, let's talk briefly. Did you watch Facts of Life? Yes, but this is part of my confusion, right? Because I was shocked just moments ago to find out that it started in 1979, 1980, because I felt like I watched that show when it was on the air, and Tootie was a young girl. She was like the youngest of all the four or five girls, and you know she was the baby of the group, and I always just felt like she was close to my age, but that is way off. I mean, because she was playing like a middle schooler or a ninth grader in 1979, we 1980, born. the year yeah. we were born. So I guess I this is another one of these ones that I was watching in reruns out of order and not realizing it that the ones that were actually currently on the air were the ones with George Clooney and I didn't even know. Yeah. I I never really watched Facts of Life, but I always knew of it. I knew about Tootie. I knew about Joe. Uh, so when we put on 
this episode, which is late in the series, it puts you right into one of these sort of latter day sitcom situations where half the cast isn't there anymore. The whole premise has sort of been altered. So there's something to that, right? The only person who actually from the original class, from the original cast that wasn't in this episode is, um, uh, what's her name? Edna, whatever the Mrs. Garrett. Mrs. Garrett. What about Blair? So Blair was still on the show. She, due to her um, religious beliefs, decided not to appear in this episode. Oh, my God. Because they were going to be talking about premarital sex, and she did not believe in that. Holy shit. Was this the first time this ever happened in nine years of the sitcom? The first time she ever had a problem with It is the only episode of the series in which she did not appear. Well, that's so funny because I just assumed she wasn't on the show anymore because it was all rejiggered late into the... Yes. No, I assumed the same when we watched it because, you know, Cloris Leachman was now the house mother. They were very clearly in college, no longer at that like girls school where they were at like the boarding house. Like that. So let's back up. What is the premise of the facts of life? What I know is it's a bunch of girls living together in a house with an old lady. So I assumed it was like some sort of sorority with like a den mother type lady. So no, it's an all girls school called um, the Eastland School. And Mrs. Garrett was a house mother and dietitian, which I didn't know, but just when I was looking it up, found that out. So she's like, like, think about if you go away to a boarding school, you have a dormitory and then there would be like a house mother who would kind of be there. So that's like my understanding is that this is some sort of, you know, mm-hmm. all girls school um, and they live there. They have. And so this is their their house. And so this episode was originally written for Blair, but because she refused to be in the show sense they retooled be... it okay. for natalie so natalie and her boyfriend snake have been dating for a year and it's their anniversary and they're going to go back to the place where they had their first date at the green something in and can i just stop and say if if you're not familiar with the show and and you hear the boyfriend's name is snake and so you picture like a guy with a bunch of tattoos and a leather jacket and a, you know, mohawk haircut or something. This is the most like norm core, like mild mannered dude, right? In like khakis and like a sweater from Sears or something. But his name is Snake. Yeah, but I think when he was originally introduced, right, wasn't he a little bit more you have rough to and tumble? Assume But it's just funny that of all the things that you could change about yourself, that you could shape up as you get older and mature, you would think the easiest one would be maybe let stop calling me snake. Yeah, well, which he does at the very end of the episode. Anyway, yeah, so I mean, that's basically the premise of the show is just that they uh, Natalie and her boyfriend are going to celebrate their one year anniversary. There is no indication other than the title the first time uh, that this is going to be an episode about losing your virginity. She goes she's excited. She goes out on her date and she comes home at five o'clock in the morning uh, he you know they walk back in the house and they're like oh the sun is coming up and they give each other a couple kisses goodbye and they act like they don't really want to say good night um but again no indication that any shenanigans have gone on she goes upstairs and uh and wants to wake up tootie because she has something so exciting she wants to tell her and then that's how it all comes out and in the entirety of the this scene where she's telling tootie what happened, she never says the word sex. Yeah, and I guess, are we supposed to understand that Natalie is the last one to lose her virginity? No, I think she's the first one. I think that's why you have Joe's response being sort of weird about it, and then Tootie being the younger one absolutely wouldn't. Oh, and by the way, we didn't mention this, but the other reason that we thought that like maybe Blair was actually no longer on the show was because Cloris Leachman has two other kids. She's got her son and then a, an Australian girl who's a boarder at the house. This is the standard ballooning mm-hmm. of the cast that they would do when late people into the leave. Run. Yeah. All right. So, so let's talk about Joe for a second. My understanding of Joe was that she was a badass. She was like a punker biker girl. Uh-huh. Uh, now, did she like. She's a tomboy. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Totally. But her whole shtick was, it was more tomboy. Like she had this sort of rough and tumble exterior. Did she like fix cars and stuff? Yeah. But she was like, 
actually kind of you know soft on the inside or really you know just well because we see her in this episode we see her in this episode and she's wearing pink that's the first thing i she was she's wearing oh a i didn't pink notice that sweat uh, sweatshirt or something okay and she's not doing anything tough oh and can we say the 80s hair in this episode it was something to see i mean while in bed tootie's hair was like at the top of her pillow um, That's right. I didn't so really big, and that. Joe's hair as well, which uh, I think Natalie's was the only one who didn't have like the super big hair. She kind of had a bob, and maybe just a little bit of the flip on the bangs that was like the you know the cow lick kind of big <laughs> thing. So Tootie initially is super excited to have this juicy gossip, like mm-hmm. you said, and then they're they're in the kitchen the next day, right? Basically, the the whole cast minus Blair, right? It's kind of like the full ensemble is yes, down there. Every, everybody's there, including the border from Australia and Cloris right. Leachman's son, who's right. like very clearly a middle schooler. Right. And so this is where Tootie pulls a screech. Oh. Screech in Saved by the Bell was notoriously, he would give up your secret for absolutely no reason, completely unprompted. See, and I was like Tootie's Lily from How I Met Your Mother. Can't keep a secret. Yeah, same thing. They love that uh, lazy plot device that there's one character that will just, you know, give up the secret just because of who they are. So Tootie just sort of randomly says, Natalie slept with Snake. And uh, everybody reacts to that. Yeah, slept with, went to bed, spent the night with. It was, they never, like, they just kept talking around it. It was like they they were having this very mature episode of Facts of Life, but they couldn't say the word sex. Yeah, which also, by the way, the name of the show is The Facts of Life. Isn't that itself like an innuendo for sex? How is the show on for nine years? It's called The Facts <laughs> of Life. And it's the first time they actually have an episode about the facts of life. Well, you see, you take the good and you take the bad. That's the thing. That's what they thought it was about. You take them both and there you have the facts of life. So basically the whole, every character becomes aware of what happened. And then they have to immediately move the conversation to another room where the middle school boy and the high school girl cannot hear them. Everybody becomes aware that Natalie slept with Snake. And she basically gets a universally negative response except, from everybody. Yeah, except for Tootie, who was just happy to hear about the gossip. Everybody else was kind of like silent, sort of giving her this look like, do you really think that was the best idea? Joe in particular just really, it, it feels really cold. The way Joe is, you know, Natalie goes like, Joe, come on, at least you, you'll back me up, right? It's not a big deal. And Joe's like, I, I don't know, Natalie, it's complicated, you know, as though she's like, oh, look, I'd like to I'd like to support you. But you're you're asking of me something I just can't can't agree with. Yeah, you know? I noticed that, too. And I was confused by that because the day before, in quotes, right, they all were so excited about her going on her date. You know, that was the one year anniversary. And they all seem to really like Snake. Um, as much as you can like a character named Snake. And so then the reaction of, oh, are you sure you should have done that made me think, oh my gosh, are there earlier episodes that we need to go back and watch? Like this guy isn't a good boyfriend or he this relationship. Great. He did. He can seemed... we say the yeah. way that the, he's introduced in the episode is after she's, it's established that she's excited that it's her anniversary, he comes in and it seems like he's forgotten. And he's he in like that... work coveralls right he lets that play for a minute or two and then he's like surprise let me rip off my like tear away big clothes because i've they got just a tuxedo snaps, underneath. you know they were just snaps and he had a suit underneath <laughs> yeah so it seems that he's a good guy they're like they an established as thing. that and everybody likes him but then the next morning sh- should you have made that choice yeah so there's this extreme sort of seriousness surrounding this and then uh just as she's sort of trying to make sense of how everybody's reacting to it she gets a call from snake yes uh and he says something to the effect of like i i can't see you today i need i need some time i need some space right 
you know, very sort of vague and inconclusive. And also, I can't see you tomorrow. Right. It was like the double rejection. Like, I'm not going to see you tonight and I'm not going to reschedule. Right. And so, of course, Natalie is sort of like cautiously optimistic and going like, well, whatever. He only, you know, he's just saying he he needs some time. But everyone's assumption is he's he's you know, used you and lose you, right? <laughs> he's, he's pulling a wham bam. And yeah. He's... Yeah. But also I think Natalie had an interesting reaction and I kind of liked it because she was both crushed and optimistic. Like she felt all the, all of that, like, oh no, this isn't good. And you could read it on her face. And she, she did a really good job with that scene and then it was only when everybody else started piling on with those negative feelings that she was like, well, you know, it's not like he's just going to up and, you know, she didn't say ghost me, but basically she like the 80s term for ghost me. Um, she was like, it's not like he's just going to never speak to me again. We've been together for a year. Like, that's yeah. not that. No, like, that's not going to happen. Um, it's not like I'm never going to hear from him again or something like that, she said. And so that, yeah. And then, but still, Tootie was still optimistic and on her side. Like mm -hmm. she, she never came over to the, you know, she was like, Oh, Nat, I'm sorry that this is hurting you. And you know, you're probably right. Kind of a, kind of that girlfriend person being like, yeah, you know, whatever. And, and if he doesn't screw him, cause he's a bad guy anyway, like you're better than that. Like she played the role of like the girlfriend and then Cloris Leachman and Joe kind of were playing the role of this, like the other the insecurities in your mind, you know, when, when you realize that th this could potentially be going in a rejected yeah. rejection way. Yeah. It's kind of like Natalie's, yeah, her inherent mindset is positivity. And then she sort of gets like yeah. contaminated by their skepticism. And so, yeah, at that point it becomes what's what's the deal right? yeah what's gonna, gonna happen break up with how her? long this is, is this gonna go on yeah and you feel this sense of like oh my god are we going to see the tragedy of natalie having been duped out of her virginity right that yeah. natalie made this horrible mistake of you know sleeping with this guy who turned out to not be you know her to turned out to not love her or right whatever. who turned out to just be putting in a year's worth of time to you know to score which seems ridiculous that's what like who would put in a year if all you were after was an easy score you know so i I, at this point in the show, was a bit frustrated because I was like, is this the direction we're really going to go? She's going to, like, learn her lesson this way? This sucks. Like, I wasn't happy with that. And then it kind of, we go to later in the day and then the next day and he still hasn't called. And even Tootie is a little bit like, hey, you know, forget about him. And she and Natalie's still like, you know what? He said he needed some space. He said he wanted to to think some things through. And I'm going to trust him in that, even though it was hurting her and she was uncomfortable, for sure. And then she seeks advice from Joe. What does Joe say? Well, it's really up to you, Nat. Like, a non-committal, yeah, more... non-answer. Yeah. And Natalie reads her the riot act. She's like, that's not an answer. If you're really my friend, you're going to tell me what you think. Because I'm struggling here and I need your advice. Yeah. And she was like... Basically, well, what do you want me to say? <laughs> you know, <laughs> she was like, if this is the way he's going about it, it sucks. But you don't need to be beating yourself up because you didn't do anything wrong. You made a decision. And so Joe sort of like switches her kind of skepticism and judginess that we saw at the beginning and was kind of like, you're a grown woman. You made this decision. You've been together a year. You love this guy. It was a wonderful night. Stop beating yourself up about it. If yeah. he chooses to head for the hills now, it's his loss. And your decision was still your decision. Did you have a good time? Have you always, have you loved him all this time? And was it fun? And she basically was like, yeah. So Joe was like, well, then stop worrying about it. Yeah. And she also, she separates the idea. She says, you're upset because he might break up with you. It's not about having had sex. Mm -hmm. and, and that is when it was like, ah, okay, they are going to. They are gonna go in a in a more like healthy, sex positive yeah. direction for women in this in this episode where she's made the decision and like you said, it's not about 
it's not about that the having sex was a bad decision. It's that, oh, it would be sad if they broke up. Exactly. But the sex has nothing to do with that. And then eventually Snake comes home. <laughs> Snake comes back and basically says, I didn't need that time alone to break up with you. I needed that time alone to crystallize my plans to marry you. Right. 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 Uh, or or like step forward into this like long-term commitment because marriage is where we're headed, isn't it? And Natalie's like, uh, say what yeah. now? <laughs> so this is where I feel like Natalie, I guess we'll see if this is borne out over the, the other shows, but I feel like she has maybe the most and possibly the only sort of healthy attitude about sex that yeah. we see across yes. All of these shows, I feel like she just lays down this, like the closest thing to a sort of balanced wisdom that we're going to get, where she's basically like, what are you talking about? Like, like maybe it's not that one thing has nothing to do with the other, but it's not a direct A to B to C right. thing. And of course, we don't need to get married because we just had sex. Right. Because we're having, because sex is now part of our relationship, it doesn't mean that we have to get married. And also, we can just still be together and take it one step at a time. Like you said, she kind of lays it all out in this very mature way of, we like each other, things are going well, we don't need to fast forward just because we had sex. I feel like what is kind of a common thread, maybe, the show is trying to grapple with this idea of like, we want you to take sex seriously and understand that it's a big deal and you can't just do it all willy-nilly, but we're not exactly sure why. Because Cloris Leachman says, in my day, you waited till you were married, right? So we're sort of acknowledging like it used to be for religious purposes or whatever, and now we're moving past that as a society and yeah, it's like they don't quite know what the parameters are. Well, I think they did give it some parameters, right? So there's there's at least two different times where Natalie or someone else says they're adults, right? And they they make a point to say that they're 21, mm -hmm. so that they're you know it's very clear they're in college. This isn't Tootie. This is you know she's she's supposed to be a little bit younger than them, I think. And then also they have the conversation with the girl from. Australia, the like high school girl, where they kind of shush, oh, shush yeah. her out of the room and say that they can't talk about this stuff when she's there because it's not appropriate for her, which then leads to Cloris Leachman going to have a conversation with her. And she and, and that character is like, look, it's not it, back in Australia. It's not as big of a deal as it is here in the United States. A lot of my friends have sex before they're even out of high school. And she she identifies herself as like 14, right? Because she's saying, so she's asking Cloris Leachman's character, oh, so when would be, a, you know, when's appropriate for me to have sex? Can I have sex when I'm 15? Can I have sex when I'm 16? Yeah. What about when I'm 17? And they have this whole conversation about that. And Cloris Leachman just shuts it down. She's like, nope, nope. So they definitely have some parameters on it where it's like, it's not appropriate to talk to the middle school boy about this. He's got to go off to school and not be a part of any of this conversation at all. It is appropriate for an adult, like a grown woman like Cloris Leachman's character, to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with this young high school girl, but she also is not allowed to be a part of these bigger conversations around sex. And then everybody is going to judge you if you do it, and you've got to find your own chutzpah to kind of stand up for yourself. Hmm. And that's, like, that was sort of the takeaway. And, and I think that that tracks right do you think that was their the intention? judgment for the judgment around a woman choosing to have sex at, at any age is, is is fraught you know yeah and so i guess to an extent you could understand why blair would protest it because it is you know as as much as it's a little rocky along the way it actually is a sort of pro uh, premarital sex right. stance. Yes. Uh, like we said, it does ultimately, it's surprising, I think, with a modern eye to look at it, it's it's surprising how much resistance Natalie gets again in, to watch it in 2023 and be like, geez, like your, your friends, your peers at 21 years old aren't patting you on the back. Well, and 
I'll say this to move, you know, we can move on to the next show. I think that what what I noticed about all four of them is that there really was like a, a positive, like feminist tilt on on all of the four episodes. Wow. All right. We've got a lot. I feel like our next one is going to, uh, I, I might challenge you a little bit on that, on the next one. Um, <laughs> well, okay. I, I see I see what you're saying, on, on, but we'll get there. So let's move on to a show that is near and dear to my heart. <laughs> um, all right. Before you get into that, head of the class, this episode uh, is called Arvid's Sure Thing, season three, episode 11, and it aired in 1989. So it was a year after the uh, Facts of Life episode that we watched. Yeah. So head of the class, I feel like, is not as ubiquitous uh as facts of life and a lot of other shows we talk about but uh that was a huge one for me uh that was i think head of the class was maybe the first sitcom that we all kind of watched together as a family there was this definite aspirational uh quality to it because it's about the the honors program um, and so it's like all these teenagers from different walks of life, uh, but they're supposed to be the smart kids and they've got this cool teacher um, who helps them with life. And so, you know, if I was like in, in grade school watching it, I just totally ate it up. Um, That's going to be me. Yeah. And so uh, this is the aforementioned episode that I don't know if it necessarily informed me about what sex was but it definitely uh a lot about this episode did not make sense to me when i first watched it i can remember very clearly this coming on all of this talk of losing your virginity and the girl's a sure thing and all of that was just completely over my head yeah um it would definitely be the first time that a show or a movie or something that i was watching would be just explicitly front and center talking about this so uh so go ahead tell them what what happens in this what's the setup for this episode? okay so the setup for this is uh, a character who's not a main character in the show someone we've never met before Rhonda, probably the most popular girl in school sets her sights on arvid he feels like the luckiest man alive but mr moore gets him to wonder why she's so popular if you've never seen head of the class Arvid is the nerdiest kid. Yeah, he's the he's, nerd of all the nerds. Right. He wears the pocket protector. He's got the glasses. Very standard 80s yeah. Revenge of the Nerds type nerd. nerd. I mean, he looks like gr the guy from Greece, like the nerdy kid in Greece, like even yes. going back further. Yeah. Yeah. So Arvid, who is this like the nerdiest of the nerds, the premise is Rhonda Gilgood, who, uh, if if you watch 90210, she was Emily Valentine. She was yeah. the girl with the short, kind of bleachy blonde hair. Uh, Rock very, set hair. Yeah, exactly. Um, she's also in Child's Play 2, which is near and dear to my heart. Uh, so she shows up uh, as this Rhonda girl who is just universally understood to be hot to trot, short She's the thing. easiest girl in school. Right. They meet her because Dennis and Arvid are in the principal's office and she's also there waiting to be called in. Dennis, who's Arvid's friend, he's also a nerd, but he's like a fat nerd instead of like a glasses and pocket protector nerd. And he's played he, by Dan Schneider. Canceled. Yeah. He saunters over. And, you know, tries to, to lay, lay down some game. Is that a thing? Sure. Uh, he, he, tries to, he, tries he tries to lay to down some it. game. He tries to kick it. He, yes. He, he, says, he says to Arvid, he says, my, um, I realize now, now that I've seen Rhonda, the, you know, most popular, easiest girl in school here in the principal's office, I realize my problem with women. I'm not asking out the right girls. I got to ask out girls who say where yes is a, you know, uh, it's it's a given. His right? targets are too discriminating. He's That's decided. right. So he's going to go ask her out. So Dennis asks her out. She says no. She blows him off. But then she just gets up, marches across the room, and sits down next to Arvid. And so begins this bizarre dynamic that I feel like will be paralleled in another one of our episodes. <laughs> but uh, she just... She takes an immediate interest in Arvid, right? Rhonda, the, you know, sort of... Good time girl. Right. Just just decides, like, 
I want to bang this guy. Uh, so she sits down next to him, then starts flirting or whatever. And what did, does she ask him out right then and there? Or does she just yeah, kind of says, I'll see you around? No, I think she says, why don't we get together? Or we should get together or something. And he doesn't, he's non-committal. He's like, right. oh yeah, okay, you know, whatever. Right. So and it's, then... yeah, she sort of gets her foot in the door and then they get called into the office, whatever. And so the scene ends and then we cut to... Uh, Mr. Moore's class, which is where like 80% of head of the class takes place. And everyone's like gathered around. Arvid is being sheepish and modest and kind of saying like, oh, it wasn't a big deal, whatever. Who knows why she talked to me? Who cares? And all the guys are gathered around him like, dude, you are about to become fuck. a man <laughs> yeah you need to follow up with this girl because she's a sure thing hence the name of the episode and she wants you you need to go and pursue that and he's like no no come on it's not like that and it isn't like at that point it's the some of the girls are there too and they're you know they're like oh arvid you know if you're interested why you know you should maybe whatever yeah. it's almost then, universal right like people like simone who's the sensitive artistic girl she has a little bit of an issue with the general vibe of yes. how excited everyone is right but i feel like, like if you're interested though you yeah, you, more you or less everyone kind of agrees like arvid this is a good thing for you right go go out with this girl whatever her intentions might be you're a nice guy you should go and the guys are like just do her right and so they have a second interaction yeah the same exact dynamic continues where it's just like she just seems very amused by him, right? It yes. seems like she gets a kick out of him. She yes. just genuinely seems to find it cute. Yeah. She seems very aware of her reputation. Mm -hmm. She knows exactly the sort of anxiety that is she she just she she knows exactly what's what's happening. Yes. She knows the anxiety that is created by her uh, interacting with him. She and knows, being so forward. Yes. She, she yeah. sees how unexpected it is and how discombobulated it makes him. I don't know if all in all, if we're going to think her characterization is perfect, but she, there's, <laughs> there's, she, she's has this definite sort of command of the situation of how she's presenting herself. Right. She's not presented yet as a girl who this reputation has been foisted upon she is a very active participant in this is who i am and i'm excited for you to come over and yeah i think your friends are getting a kick out of it but uh hey now i'm gonna flirt even harder and why don't you come over tonight because we yeah. don't need to go out to dinner i can make it to my house she's not being super sexual she's not just saying anything like explicit or suggestive no. or anything she's just she's flirting yeah hard exactly. flirting. and and we should be alone together she says come over to my house tonight right and so that's when he consults mr moore and it, it's part of the the lore of the show mr moore is like a single dude he's like basically a failed actor who took a, a substitute teaching job and you know yada yada all right uh so everyone kind of knows that in his own sort of weird old guy way he's he's a bachelor he's right. like he's a man out about there dating town. right right okay so arvid basically says like how was your weekend he 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 goes. <laughs> Did you have a date? Mister Moore starts going like, "Well, it's not really any of your business, but yeah, I did." And he goes, "Okay, who unhooked the bras here?" Oh, that's right. right. That's that right. is his question. Who unhooked the bras here? <laughs> and then he proceeds to say the word bras here like seven or eight times in the ensuing conversation. Obviously, Mr. Moore is uh, surprised and alarmed by that question. Uh, but he basically says, like, Mr. Moore, I'm probably going to have sex this Friday night. Yeah. Like, what what should I do? And it's an interesting wrinkle. Mr. Moore knows Rhonda because the honors history class is not his only class. So he knows her. I'm interested to hear your take about this because I feel like Mr. Moore maybe has one of the more problematic uh, takes that we, we see in all these episodes. I feel like he brushes up against some sort of slut shaming, uh, yeah. no goodness, but not, I don't know. He goes, but he only brushes up against it. 
Right. It's not so bad. He goes, he goes, I know Rhonda. She's a troubled girl, right? So as soon as he said that, I'm going like, all right, what is this going to be? But he kind of substantiates it. And he goes like, it's not just the sex stuff. It's she, she's a bad student. She's doesn't go to class. She does this and that. Like she just obviously has problems. And then she, he throws in there. She's promiscuous. Right. Yes. And, and, and he also says that, um, something about her being lonely. Yeah. So he asks Arvid, basically, he says, try to see it from her point of view, right? You know that she sleeps with all these guys. So why do you think she does that? And yeah, he tells Arvid to inquire into that yeah, for sure. But not necessarily like to inquire with her, I think to to just ponder it himself. Himself. Uh, and he sort of, I don't think he really has an answer. He just starts sort of like musing Mr. Moore's take on it is, is what is it? Is it more of the same from facts of life where it's like, you just have to take this seriously, just make sure that you're not just no. doing it willy nilly. No. And the reason is because Arvid is a guy and this is a guy talking about losing his virginity, not a girl. So the tone is completely different in the Fresh Prince and in Head of the Class when we have a guy potentially losing their virginity than we have in Full House and Facts of Life where it's a girl who's losing or potentially losing her virginity. So his kind of, or his, like Mr. Moore's big push is, you know, think about why she wants this, number one. Like, think about that for yourself. And two, you know, you need to be, you need to use protection. Mr. Moore says, um, just make sure you wear a condom. Yes. Uh, and that takes us to the, the next close scene. up on the face of condom. Yes. Yeah. Arvid hadn't even considered that. Uh, so that takes us to the pharmacy scene. Which is the best scene we watched out of all four episodes. This scene is almost as though Arvid is a grown man now retelling the story of the night he almost lost his virginity, right? He, because of all of the like stylistic heightened ways that people are stopping and looking at him and staring at him and, and, and it sounds as though, or it, it plays as though someone is telling this story where you know, you were, it was the height of embarrassment and you're older and yeah. retelling. <laughs> he does the thing of going up there, you know, and, and wanting to buy a bunch of other stuff so right. that like, you don't even notice that he's buying condoms. Cause it's only like one of many things. But, but the way he got to that was that he keeps walking toward the condoms. And every time he walks toward the condoms to pick up a box, the pharmacist looks up from his phone call, which is silent by yeah. the way. And, and he grabs something that's on the way to the condoms or asks about cotton balls. Yeah. What are the different types of yeah. cotton balls? Because he can't even say the word condom. So he gets as far as the CO uh, and then he, he lands on <laughs> cotton balls. So there's all this wacky, you know, slapstick stuff. It ends with a woman. Like <laughs> and somehow... everybody, at this point though, everybody knows. Like everyone in the store keeps turning and staring at him when he goes to grab the condoms and then he grabs something else. And the woman who's standing directly behind the condoms on the other side of the shelf, she's got a stone face. Like you don't think she knows at all until the very last second where he is sort of like reaching his hand as though his hand is moving of its own volition. And then she turns and looks at him and he reaches over the shelf to grab something else. And she says, if you're going to do this adult thing, you better be adult about it. She's like, and if you can't do it, I'll buy them for you. It's on me and it better be on you. That's right. I forgot about that. Yeah, that's what gets the standing ovation from the studio audience. I'd say in this episode for head of the class, there's a lot of uh, outside the school action. And so, yeah, because we get the pharmacy and then we get Rhonda's parents apartment. So this, this palatial. Yes. Right? That's what I was going to say. These people that's in New York city and this apartment is huge. And this is when we find out the loneliness thing, right? Her parents are never around. Her parents don't yes. care. They're not there. They're highfalutin business people. Her dad is a salesman 
and her mom is his assistant or his something or other. But this, but they travel for work and they're never there and they know what she's doing and they don't care, but they like to judge her, but they don't stay around anyway. Is basically what she tells Arvid. Yeah. Now, can we take a second to acknowledge Arvid is dressed amazingly, right, for the date? He's wearing Jay's perfect outfit. I would say, first of all... Patches on the elbows. It's so funny how the fashion has completely reversed itself. And Arvid, who's supposed to be like the tackiest goofball in the world, actually looks pretty good. I think it's something... Brown on brown is what he's wearing. Yeah, there's a lot of like mustards and browns and stuff. And I I don't know if I necessarily would go for those exact combinations, but he looks much closer to something that you would see somebody wearing in Brooklyn or something, I think, now than what Mr. Moore wears, who looks absolutely ridiculous. I mean, it is kind of dated, right? Like, if you think that this is 1989, that's definitely, like, 70s style. Yes. And she's very, like, hip. She's got the oversized shirt, very colorful, but, you know, the bigger hair, the shoulder pads. Um, over black leggings like she's very cool yeah i think that's what it is is they're they're they think that he looks ridiculous because they're styling him like you said kind of behind the time mm-hmm. but when you watch it now it's like well the 70s stuff looks better than the 80s stuff so like i think he looks pretty good but so, <laughs> so anyway so they're in the apartment yeah and she's like let's get down to it you yeah. know she just starts let's kissing go. Him. they make small talk for a couple minutes she starts kissing him and he just like keeps talking, right? Like yeah. just keeps like remarking on things while she's like nuzzling his ear and stuff like and, that. Like kissing all down his face while he's just, that was the part of that scene that I was like, wow, I don't care how good of an actor you are. That's fucking distracting when somebody is kissing you all over, like kissing your neck and kissing your ear and like all yeah. of that, that's distracting. And he just keeps it straight down the middle. He's just like, reading, you know, a physics textbook and is like, so, and let me tell you another interesting factoid and blah, 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 blah. And like is never pulled off his mark for a second. Yeah. Uh, And so, but there comes a point where she's like, all right, what's the deal? Why are you not, you know, uh, engaging with me? And I don't know, is is, he's just kind of stalling or he's just... He's kind of stalling. He comes back around to the point, right? that that Mr. Moore made which was you know I don't know you and and you don't know me and so maybe maybe we should do something about that yeah and I guess this is what I found and he also asked why me he asked that too and she says what you're cute you're funny right like she doesn't she's non-committal at first but then later when he is like but we don't know each other. Maybe we should get to know each other. She then admits like, well, actually, I thought that you might be nicer than the other guy, you know, some of these other guys that I've been with. And I was hoping that maybe it all comes back around to, you know, the like post-coital talk. That's what Arvid says. Like, yeah. why don't, you know, I guess most people do this post-coital talk. Why don't we do some of that? prior to and that becomes like the joke that they're having the post-coital talk but never had coitus bazinga yeah Uh (laughs) i guess this is what i found sort of troubling is the way uh ronda just basically diagnoses herself in this very sort of like cut to the point sitcom way yeah just very kind of flat simplistic she's just like well my parents don't pay attention to me, so that's why I do this. You know, like that's almost verbatim what she says. Yeah, She's I'm, like, yes. I am promiscuous because my parents don't pay attention. What else do I have to do? I'm always here in this, you know, big apartment and they're always gone. And I'm looking for people to pay attention to me. I guess it's not horrible, but it just... It just reminds me of that original Catch-22 thing of like, well, if you can know you're crazy, then you're not crazy. You know, it's like if you're if this is really some sort of problem you have that's manifesting in your behavior, you can't just sit back and explain like, oh, well, the reason I do that is because my parents don't provide me with enough attention. You know, like it just seemed like just so like easy and and just sort of yeah i mean again i kind of just took that as like it had to be right it's a half hour show like they they 
did all the hilarity of the awkwardness and the condom scene and all of that. Like there's, and then, and then they want to have this whole scene where he's so nut. like, look at him. He's so sweet. And he's, they actually talk and they actually get to know one another. And then they decide to go out for dinner and go on a proper date at the end, which is really, you know, really sweet or whatever. And yeah, no, they allow her to be just this sort of like one dimensional character. What, you know, basically what Mr. Moore said is true. You ask me why I do these things. It's because I'm lonely. It's because I want attention. So now, you know, it seemed like at the end, it was like, well, maybe they're going to be friends and maybe then she'll make better choices once she's not so lonely anymore. Yeah. But what, what isn't in the episode and what I kind of was thinking about, it was like, and why I thought of this episode more as still having a sort of feminist bent in the ways that some of the others did too, is just that like, she she's alone all the time. She is, has this gorgeous place in New York city and she is living her life, right? Like she doesn't want to go to school. She doesn't have to go to school. Her parents are rich. She'll get into a good college. She doesn't care. Like she's not in the honors class. So C's will get you degrees. You know what I mean? It just, to me, it sort of just seemed like, yeah, she just, she liked having these men, gentlemen callers. And it is a bummer sometimes when they don't stick around, but Hey, you seem nice and we're going to go out to dinner. So, okay, let's do that. I think it's presenting her as a cautionary tale. Like, I don't think it's, it's saying like, you go girl. I think. No, I don't think it's saying you go girl, but I don't think they, I think she's so one dimensional that it also isn't presenting her as a cautionary tale. She is absolutely there as a construct so that Arvid can have this whole like thought process about when is the right time to lose my virginity and should it be with a woman that I care about or should it just be who, whoever, which is the same man lesson that Carlton learns. Yeah. Right. And so that's what's so interesting to me is that this parallel lesson for when guys decide to lose their virginity is should I just do it to do it? Cause that's what everybody wants me to do. Hey, hey, hey. Or should I actually care? Mm -hmm. And they both go through that same thought process. And so it, she's not meant to be anything more than that one dimension. Yeah. I feel like that's, it, it comes off better the more it's just from her, his point of view. I think the yeah. more you try to think of it as she being her own character, no. the more it breaks down into this sort of like... Why yeah. isn't she... Well, yes. No, you have to let go of that idea because, I mean, we could fight battles forever about one-dimensional female characters and male stories, right? Like, that's just sort of... That's a universal problem. In this instance, they told a good story. They didn't necessarily need a, a three-dimensional, you know, or a two-dimensional character there. Uh, shall we move on to the Full House? Yes, Full House. This episode of Full House is Season 7, Episode 2. The title is The Apartment. Steve gets, Steve DJ's boyfriend, uh, gets an apartment. I guess he's now in college, even though she is still in high school. Uh, he's got an apartment, and then DJ goes over to hang out for the night. It's supposed to be with Kimmy, but then Kimmy's parents wouldn't let her go. And then Steve's roommate also has plans, so he's gone. So they end up alone in his apartment and comedy ensues. Now let's back up a sec. Everyone knows what Full House is. Uh, I think that's that's one of the when we talk about TGIF, right? The inspiration yep. for this whole thing, Full House. I, I would say in general, going back to the whole sort of concept of our podcast and all these dopey sitcoms we grew up with and the weird tropes that they all you know, yeah. deal Full with. House was definitely top of mind when Absolutely. we came up with this idea. Absolutely. Yeah. Full House, it just hits all of those beats, all of those cliches. And for me, like it, it was ubiquitous. It, it was one of those like it, it was there every step of the way, you know, like it was I, I remember it, it being on prime time when I was a kid. I remember it being on in the, you know, uh, syndicated reruns after school. Uh, it had so many, you know, it had so many seasons that it just like it, between the original airings and the reruns and all that. And uh, then they even made Fuller House. <laughs> we, don't, we don't need to get to all that. <laughs> I just want to say, since since it's our first time, you know, visiting it, I'm sure Full House is one we're going to come back to again and again and again. Very high on the cheesiness factor, right, from day one. Yes. Uh, the thing that stood out for me in this episode was the absolute bananas B-plot. 
Jesse and Joey have been tasked with getting bids to pave a driveway in or repave or pave for the first time, create a driveway uh, outside the house. And Jesse starts crunching the numbers and realizes pretty quickly that he can do it cheaper himself. But the crunching the numbers thing, that is, I, I think that gets my award for like the best genuine laugh of all of all of the shows we watched that that I thought was really funny in a very intentional way when uh Joey's got his his calculator watch and so Jesse is going through his itemized thing he's trying to figure out how much it's going to cost so he's going like all right so we're going to need such and such amount of cement and we're going to need how however much many to rent the sand and gravel and, yes. right and and he's, Joey is punching things in on his watch and then so Jesse's like so what does that come to and Joey goes well it took you about 19 seconds to say all that <laughs> i thought that was a genuinely funny bit i did not remember this I mean, comedy duo, like, you know, Rowan yes. and Martin's sort of yeah. shtick that and they in were in general, doing. yeah, the B, C, and D stories, because at this point, Full House has like 37 characters in the opening credits. They they are like comic strips to me because they're, they're these tiny things. You have, yeah, these little moments of like, oh, uh, you know, Jesse and Joey need to pave the cement into the driveway. Something weird's going to happen there. And then you have... Michelle and Stephanie uh, got leaves in the right. in their bedroom. Right. Michelle comes home from school and says, well, tomorrow is hobby day. So we all have to bring our uh, something of our hobby at school to share. And she's like, but I don't have a hobby. So I need one. And then the next thing we see is her in the bedroom, which used to be Stephanie and DJ's met bedroom, but now DJ's older has her own room. So it's DJ or it's Stephanie and Michelle's bedroom is covered in bags of leaves because Michelle has decided that her hobby is collecting leaves. And she's like, I got all the ones from the, from the backyard over here. And then all the ones from the front yard over here. And the the room's a mess. And Stephanie comes in, loses her mind, and is like, Michelle, clean this up. Michelle says no, and she starts chucking things out the window. And then, like, Michelle's like, you're going to throw my hobby out the window? I'm going to throw Mr. Bear out the window. Yeah, Mr. Bear always manages to get imperiled in these <laughs> uh, in these spats. But yeah, there are these little things. It's impressive the way, you know, they, these writers have to cram in. It's probably like four pages of the script for the entire episode you know like that those little dumb side stories get advanced in these like you know 90 second chunks in between the main story right so let's get to the main story so dj's boyfriend is steve who is is i always knew that he was the voice of aladdin in aladdin but watching it now it's distracting how much he sounds like aladdin but yeah, I guess he's older, so he's... Yeah, like uh, a year older in school, right? So he's she's like a senior, he's like a freshman in college or something, and she's yeah. like a senior in high school, I think. And yeah, the, I mean, it's it's a very... There's never any... This is the one there's no mention of sex, right? Never any mention of, of sex at all. It's she and Kimmy are going to go and hang out at Steve's new apartment. And, you know, Danny's a, the dad is a little bit like, oh, uh, well, wait a minute. And um, they're both like, you know, Kimmy and DJ both are like, no, whatever. Everybody, I mean, we're just going to hang out and watch a movie. It's just like hanging out here. It's no big deal. You need to relax, dad. Dad doesn't say anything about, you know, this. No, there's all. this understood. It, it's understood why he's anxious about it. Sure, like, it's understood. But yeah. would it be understood if you were... 12 when you watched yeah, it. You're right. It's designed to not be explicit and to not, unlike head of the class, to not introduce you to the concept of sex if you don't know what that is. Right. But right. it's not like it's ignoring that possibility. It's No, it's it but it is done in like looks and a and sort of like dad anxiety, not anything yeah. that's said. And then when they get to the apartment and we find out that Oh, you know, Kimmy ended up not being allowed to go and the roommate's gone. And then the two of them are like, wow, we've really been wanting some alone time. Isn't this nice? And then they yeah. kiss and then they do a longer kiss. Yes, which was weird. These shows were all shot in front of a studio audience and with Full House, they're always hooting and hollering and laughing and clapping <laughs> and stuff. Uh, and... 
you know, yeah, they, they start making out on the couch and it's, it's meant to make you kind of think for a second, like, are they going to bone? Like it's, it's meant for you to kind of go like, oh my gosh, this is, this is maybe where that's headed. And it's well, just, yeah, the longer kiss definitely. Cause like the first kiss got a woo, like always. And then the, but the longer kiss got a, woo, oh. yeah. And then silence. And it just creates yeah. this awkward moment where you're going like, so are they, do they want us to really like entertain the notion that these two are just going to start like boning on the couch, uh, <laughs> you know, in front of the audience? Uh, no. Yeah, no, it does. And then DJ is like, wait a minute. You yeah. know, I know that we've wanted to have this alone time, but we that doesn't mean we have to like move any faster than we've been moving. Like, let's just let's just take it slow. Let's just enjoy I, Like, I'm feeling pressured just by the fact that we're alone. And Steve was like, yeah, totally OK, fine. cool. It, that that sounds great. Let's, yeah, you know, the watch least a movie. horny 18 uh, yes. year old boy in America. I mean, it was like they they were the most mature couple that I have ever seen. That's also sort of a takeaway from this whole thing. Like Danny's the one, the dad is the one that comes off as immature over and over again in this episode Definitely. where DJ is very much like, why wouldn't you trust me? Although I have an issue with the whole like dad apologizing at the end after daughter floods the fricking kitchen well, with cement yeah, because that's... they're making out in a cement truck. Before we get there, Danny sets a curfew, right? Bob Saget right, says like, like 11, got to be yeah, home by 11 You can go to his apartment, but you have to be home by yeah, a certain time. Yeah. And so what happens is they, they make out for a little bit. But like you said, they ultimately decide we're not going to have sex. Everybody's fine with that. And, and they don't even say sex. She's just like, hey, we don't yeah. I'm feeling like I'm feeling pressure because we're alone. We don't have to go very fast. Like we can we can keep going slow. Yeah. yeah. And then they just fall asleep, uh, cuddling on the couch, watching TV. But that means she misses curfew. And so, yeah, Danny goes and he's looking, you know, there's slapstick stuff with looking through the window. Right. He sees them, which becomes a, a key point later on. He sees them asleep on the couch. Yeah. But that's the thing. He see as soon as that happened, I was like, oh, this is the best thing that could have happened because he sees them you know, candidly, like without them knowing that he's even watching. So right. he sees that they're just asleep, fully clothed. Well, like, DJ's covered all the way up. So you don't know whether or not she's clothed or not until he falls off the chair that he's looking through the window on. And then there's no there's no time lapse between them opening the door and her being dressed. So, yeah. like, at first, when he sees them, she could be under the covers completely naked, but he doesn't know that. And then he, I guess she he could. knows immediately, though, because the door opens and they're fully clothed. Yeah. And even the fact that they're on the couch, it just to me, it seemed like a fairly no, innocent. That's true. scene that he came across yes um and so you know he, he comes in and and he's mad and he takes her home and says you're never allowed to come here again and then yeah in the coming days when steve goes over there to to visit and talk to dj he's like following them around and and right you know, so steve comes them. over like the next day or whatever and now they've the you know the b plots in full swing because they've rented the truck and they have they've paved the driveway it's all beautiful it just needs to dry and steve comes over and they're admiring their handiwork and then he walks past and we get to see this lovely smooth paved driveway and then oh man we've paved the truck in yeah so we can't get rid of the truck because we can't drive it over the wet cement so we have to wait for the driveway to cure for 72 hours. Classic cement-based right. humor. And because the cement will cure in that time, that also means we have to turn the truck on so that it keeps rolling to keep the cement inside the truck from hardening for the next 72 hours. So now we've set up the calamity right. that's going to happen right. in Act 3. The inevitable, you know, symphony of uh, <laughs> of narratives, uh, yeah, comes to a head when, uh, yeah, DJ and Steve 
take refuge in the cement truck just to talk. And then what happened? They just pushed the lever. Are they making out? They're or? making out. Yeah. So they they try to go around the house to like different places and Danny keeps vacuuming or hoovering them out of every room, yeah, as Steve said. He gets distracted because the two younger girls have this leaf fight going on. Yeah. And so he's dealing with that. And DJ and Steve sneak away and go find some privacy in the cab of the running cement truck where the conversation that they've been saying they want to have doesn't happen. They immediately start making out and this time go horizontal in the cab of this truck and kick the lever of the chute that starts running the cement into the house. So the 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 little chute breaks through the window and goes into the kitchen and starts pouring cement it's, everywhere. It is upsetting. There's this level of uh lunacy that is meant to be all in good fun and i just like as a person i'm not even a homeowner but it's still it it was just yeah uh, it just no, as hellish. a grown-up yeah. watching that now it was yes absolutely like you you have to take yourself out of it this can't this is so heightened this can't possibly be real but it's interesting because that's where to me, this show really, it tells you, it's telling you in all of its actions that it's meant for kids. Yes. So like, this was definitely a show I watched with my family, like my parents, my little brother, we watched this together as a family because it was a show that was for kids that had, I guess, some stuff funny enough that if you were a grown up, you didn't mind watching it. So to that point, regardless of the cement debacle, we cut to the heart of it, you know. The cement is cleaned up. All like Steve has gone home and right. DJ's upstairs after something happened off screen where clearly there was a, you know, you're grounded, you're in trouble. She's in her room. Right. Like every Full House episode, it ends with the daddy daughter talk. And this is where it, it basically commits to a world in which premarital sex does not exist. Yes. Because Danny says... I don't know. I guess I got too uptight or whatever. I was concerned. And DJ says, oh, don't worry. I'm not wait. I, I wrote it down. Hang on. There is so much I want to see before I get married and have a family. Right. Her answer to I was concerned you might have had sex the and other he didn't night. say have sex. No, right. But, yes. Right. But never his, the her, word is said. No, it's not. It's but, alone time. Right. But her response to the uh, to the intimated concern that she might have had sex is, "Don't worry. There is so much I want to do and see before I get married and have a family." As though the idea of having sex without being married is like walking on the moon or something. It's just Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. And that happen. was the same thing that happened in the other episode that we watched where a woman was contemplating or losing her virginity was that the assumption, the popular assumption is that once you do this, that means you get married. This is it for you. Yeah. But the difference is that facts of life brings up that question and at least gives you a few different points yes. of view on it. This Full House episode just does not acknowledge even the possibility. Well, okay. And so I, I forgot to say something when we were talking about Facts of Life, but there was a disclaimer on that Facts of Life episode prior to when it was airing. Like in the credit sequence, it said, tonight's episode of Facts of Life, you may want to watch with your children. Hmm. That was not a disclaimer on this. They very clearly kept it away right. from that because they know that, I, I think, because they know that th there were more children as the audience for this show yes. than potentially a Facts of Life when they're in their college years at this is more calculated for, for sure. sure. But now I remember watching this as a teenager, right? This aired in September 93. So I would have been like 12 or 13 and absolutely was on DJ's side from beginning to end of this. Like when she had to sit down and have that daddy daughter talk with her dad at the end about how he didn't trust her and how she was so matter of fact and so self-assured, like I know what I want to do with my life and it is not get knocked up when I'm in high school. There's so many things that I want to do and I want to see before I have kids, before I get married. And yes, you're right. You're, she's lumping it all together. But I remember 
saying those same words as a teenager in the 90s. Like, I will have sex when I am good and ready. You know, it wasn't necessarily tied to marriage, but it was like, there's a time and a place for everything. And it's not now. Like that, that definitely resonated. And also that does mean is that you should trust me when I want to have alone time with my boyfriend or when I want to, you know, be respected for the young adult that I am becoming. That like responsibility and maturity in DJ's talk with her dad when he was apologizing, which again, I think is ridiculous now as a grown up, but in the time was like, he absolutely should apologize. He forced her out into that, into that cement truck. And none of this would have happened if it wasn't for him hoovering him out of every room. It's funny from my point of view, watching this, I was Steve in this scenario. I was a college guy with a girlfriend a couple years younger. That was what this made me think of and how the parents at that point are just clinging to this. I can't just let you go to this guy's house completely unsupervised, but it's like it's like this lame duck presidency where it's <laughs> like they know it's going to happen yeah, in six months anyway exactly, when you go away where to it's college. It's like that adulthood is right around the corner, and I think what I you know definitely did not back then did not have any sympathy with was that from the parents' point of view, the girl getting together with the the slightly older guy, it's it's taking away from you that final little transition phase, you know, and it's, it's sort of forcing you to, to skip right to that letting go just a step or two earlier than you would have to, if she just found some boy that was exactly the same age, and then you wouldn't have to deal with this thing of going to the dorm room or to the house off campus or right, whatever. His parents would still be involved in his like curfew and his nighttime activities. Yeah. So we should um, talk about Fresh yeah. Prince. Yeah. So Fresh Prince of Bel Air, season four, episode five. It's better to have loved and lost it. Ellipses. So this is another case of we're joining the show. In the later years, because this is already where they're out of the house and they're living in the boathouse or whatever. And yet another one, right? Now we have yet another episode where there's this wacky B plot of the wackiest of B plots. Where the ju- where Phil, Philip, whatever, the dad Uncle Phil. He's a judge. And uh some media or some ca- other candidate or something is they're trying to dig up dirt on all the judges. And Jeffrey the butler keeps freaking out and dropping things when he hears this because apparently, we don't know at the beginning, he's got some skeletons in his closet. Yes, and I have to admit, uh, it successfully faked me out because I thought it was going to be an uh, immigration issue. Which, which they do make that joke at the very story. end. Yeah, but, they make that joke at the very yes, end. But that... the A story is another virginity thing. And yes. can I say off the bat... Is the movie The 40-Year-Old Virgin stolen from this episode of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? Because this episode begins with a poker game in which you got Will, you got Carlton, you got Jazz, right? DJ Jazzy Jeff has the wacky friend Jazz. And one or two other one other fellas. friend, one other friend who uh, I don't know who he is, and no. he is harsh. He's like, man, I remember my first yeah. time. They're playing poker. <laughs> They're trading stories like us boys always do oh, about yes. the first time they ever had sex, and it, it's just like that scene in Forty Year Old Virgin where everyone's chiming in. But uh, the one guy has nothing to say. In this case, it's Carlton. But unlike 40-year-old virgin, Carlton comes clean immediately. Oh, he's a proud, proud virgin. Yes, he's proud of it. Uh, yeah, he says, I'm I'm waiting. He doesn't say I'm, I'm saving myself for marriage. No. That concept, this is the opposite of Full House. Right. And this, the concept of saving yourself for marriage is not even on the table. No, because it's guys. Uh, yeah. 
it's it's Carlton saying, I'm I'm just I just want it to be special. She's right? gotta That's be his... I've gotta be in love with her. She's gotta be Miss Wright. It's gotta be the woman. Yeah. The funny thing though is Will Smith, when he gets like super silly, he'll do that thing where like for a few seconds he'll he 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 wants to make it seem like like Carlton is like Mr. Ladies Man or something. Yes. So he does one of those like he goes, the only trouble this guy has is putting the names to the faces, you know what That's I mean? That's right. That's what it was. <laughs> The yeah. names to the faces. It, yeah, he just he gets so <laughs> kind of silly with his gestures and his faces and everything. Uh, it's it's really funny. And so Will's tack is to like he thinks he's being a good friend right, to Carlton to, to be like I will corroborate the fact that this guy is a freaking you know Lothario. But Carlton's like no, not necessary. Like I have never had sex and I don't want to until I meet the special woman of my dreams. And then we cut to a scene like the next day where they're in the student union and he's like Carlton, don't you know we're grown men now we're in college. We've got to yes. lie about this stuff. Yes. Yeah. Which is like, it's a horrible message, but it is funny. Again, the way he delivers it is just like, at least be a man and lie. But so in the store, Carlton meets, what's her name? Joanne. Yes. Yeah. Her name's Joanne. And no, so Carlton is describing to Will about why it's important that he shouldn't lie and mm -hmm. that he is a proud virgin and he's going to remain one until he meets this woman and he describes her. And this Joanne person is walking around in the background and every single thing that Carlton oh, describes, yeah. she is the embodiment of it and Will sees it but and is like, is, oh! Yeah, the joke is that then when she goes to ask Carlton a question, she's just he's like, can't you see we're talking? Leave us alone. Right, and he blows her off because he doesn't see any of that but will has seen word for word her act out all the qualities and miss right that carlton wants so carlton starts talking to her and there's a little bit of a fake out because it's like she says something about princeton but then it turns out she doesn't really like princeton that much but then she says something about tom jones and that just like they do that 90s thing of of the it's cutting to a music cue or something like dreamweaver in wayne's world she's they, perfect and so I guess he act, asks her out. Yes, and she says yes. I mean, it it was it's yeah. very quick, and and you kind of get the impression that she's in, like that she's interested. And even though he yelled at her in the first place, she very quickly is like, "Yeah, let's yeah. go, let's go," and so, off they go together to go have dinner. Yeah. And what I'm gonna say is, I think this woman gets the least interiority of anyone right in any of these shows like she's kind of a black box in terms of like what the hell she's thinking yeah and in terms of what the hell she's thinking absolutely but she is introduced as the perfect woman like as she's making her way around the bookstore she lights up the room with her smile and yes, the lights it's come in on she asks ways. For it's super... in dating profile ways it's yes. in the thing of she likes tom jones and i like tom jones yes. you know it's she all likes this book yeah it's superficial she, yeah. bullshit and uh, but she does get more of an introduction than the easiest girl in school. Right. But I still <laughs> feel like by the end of, of that, we got more of a sense of uh, of Rhonda than we ever do of Joanna. But before we even Joanne. get there, Joanne, what I was going to say to that idea, uh, I think the dynamic becomes very similar to Arvid and Rhonda because yes. Joanne, Carlton is oblivious and dopey. And uh, uh but he's not as dopey as Arvid. He's I would argue more dopey in the sense that when when they they have their date, I think we don't get to see much of the date. We get to see the sort of like door doorstep scene. Yes, afterwards. he's dropping her back off at, and at you know, Carlton after a nice date. Right. So unlike Arvid in head of the class, who knew I'm going to have sex and I need to decide what to do about that, Carlton. It's it's one of those sitcom things where for the needs of the scene, he's just a total moron and like does not pick up on anything she's saying. They're saying goodbye and there's no awkwardness. Like Carlton is being a normal dude saying goodbye. He was like, wow, you know, kind of, I mean, he is sort of, gosh, I really like this date or whatever. And she's smiling and nodding and it, it wasn't awkward. And then he was like, can I kiss you goodnight? And she says, and you know, it's coming. Like it is absolutely, you know, what's going to come out of her mouth. She's like tomorrow morning. And mm. that's when he's like, oh, you know, gets the big eyes and gets the whatever. He gets pulled into the bedroom. And this is the only show where 
they actually have the time of the sex exist in the actual show. And it is a flower with a bee on oh, it. Oh my God. And yeah. then another okay. image. I know there's a montage. Yes. I look down to write a note. And so I missed several of these images. The one image I definitely made a mental record of is a dog catching a Frisbee. Yes. And then there was some sort of like wave crashing or avalanche happening. Yes. He thinks she's Miss Wright and she's been Miss Wright and all is well with the world. He comes home the next morning in the same clothes. He does his Carlton dance, you know, and is all happy. And then they have this sort of weird conversation where he's telling, they're speaking oh, that metaphorically. Was that was funny. Because the younger yeah. daughter is Actually, in the room. Is in the room. And so Will is going like, did you close that deal with that business advisor or something? Yeah. It's it's yeah. a very obvious joke that you know is coming, but it's still kind of funny. We're like, they're talking in all these and dumb we prote- I protected my assets and all of that. And, yeah. then- and then they leave. Hillary walks in and asks Ashley, what was that all about? And she goes, Carlton lost his virginity. So uh, Carlton is sort of like basking in that. In the uh, afterglow, as yeah. it were. We start getting that B story you were talking about with Jeffries g- getting yes. nervous about the, you know, there's a committee investigating all the potential judges. And right. so he, you got the sense he's got something that he's he's going to have to confess but then ultimately everything comes to a head when they go to like an event, right? There's, yeah, the reception for this guy who um, works at their school but went to Princeton. And that's Carlton wants to meet this guy because he wants him to put in a good word for him so he can get into Princeton. So now we're at the party. It's like the next night or something. We're at this reception. And Carlton has made his introductions to this guy that has a position of power and basically is like, well, all it takes is one call for me to get you into yes. Princeton. There's always, you know, if your character is, is you know, at the age of wanting to get into college, there's always some grown up that they have to impress that's like going to make a call and get them into. I don't know that. I don't know anybody who got into college that way. You know. <laughs> well, I know some friends that were applying to Ivy's. You did have to do an alumni interview, but I don't know how much that was one phone call. So basically you find out that this guy, this old alumni guy or whatever that this is all for, uh, Joanne is his wife. Yeah. And Carlton is her side piece. Or her just for now, because they're only in town for this short period of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I mean, I I don't know what to say. So yeah, so Carlton has built that he's so excited. He feels like he's found her. He's been running this high all day long. He's so excited to see her again. And then have you met my wife? And boom, there she is. And there's this, you know, he has this realization. And so everything that he had wanted was taken away from him. And it just, again, this is what I mean by like no interiority for Joanne. Just like... What is she doing? I mean, they had that little conversation at the, where he asks her that. He's like, "What you know? Or you know, are we going to run away together now? Like, what are we going to do when you know what?" And she's like, "No, no, 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 no. That's not at all what this is. This is, you know, I like to have a little fun sometimes, and that's what that was. And you know, but it's just so brazen. sorry about it. Why? Like, because she's having an affair with like some guy that like I, I don't know to what extent she's aware of Carlton's connection to. Uh, yeah. Her also, husband. some child. Like, if she's old enough to be married. Well, and then yeah, he's that, young, yeah, that's a whole other thing. Yeah, this guy. Even... Yeah. How how old is this guy? Are we just supposed to understand? He's like. A full on like adult like and forty we, year old guy. Yeah, and we and, split the difference for her and say she's, and she's like twenty nine or something. So this again, though, maybe the reason that it didn't strike us as so odd is that Carlton is actually older. You yeah, know, definitely. right? Alfonso Ribeiro at that time. Um, this is ninety three. Like right? Yeah, this is ninety three. He was born in seventy one, so he's 23. yeah twenty three. So maybe her. I don't know. You're just sort of left to go like, all right, I guess she sucks. And uh, now Carlton's, you know, dream of losing his virginity to the perfect woman has been shattered. Uh, And And that's it. There is a scene between Will and 
Carlton that I misremembered because I had a memory of this scene taking place in a church and it's that it takes place in a tree house. And Will says something to the effect of like, maybe I should have been more careful, more romantical or whatever. Maybe I should have taken it more seriously myself. Like I kind of admired you for having that sort of idealism, but yeah, I don't know. In the end, it's just like a little bit of a cautionary tale of like Carlton was careful, but not careful enough. Like what, what's, what are we supposed to take from that? I don't know. Again, I think it's the same lesson for both of the guys that it shouldn't just be because everybody says you need to lose it, that you need to lose it. And so in the one instance, we had Arvid heed the advice and decide to get to know the girl and not have sex. The guys have this, like these cautionary tales of like, make sure it matters to you because we know everybody just wants to do it. We know you're horny, make sure it matters. And the girls have a different message. It's the responsible thing is to be with a guy that you know, you're going to be with and you're committed to. And that is what you need to make sure that you're choosing oh, but isn't responsibly. That, isn't that kind of similar? Isn't that what would make it special? Is... Yeah, but it comes from different angles, right? So it comes from the, we know you're going to do it. And so make it special for the guys. And it comes from that you shouldn't do it. So with But the... if you do. Okay. And it's also like with a guy, it can be special, but momentary. Whereas with yeah. the girl, it has to be like, this has got to be, you got to be in it for the, for the whole time. Yeah. And both of the guys have the peer pressure of the positive peer pressure. Like yeah. this is the best thing ever. And both of, well, not DJ, cause that, you know, whatever that they don't even talk about sex and that, but Natalie has the, has the peer pressure the other way. Like you shouldn't Definitely. have done it. You're going to be judged. This is a bad choice. Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? So, yeah, I think, uh, we I don't popped know. our pot cherry. Yeah. Like I said, I feel like they're all dealing with this, like, Mainstream society is not religious in that way right. anymore. It, it almost seemed like AIDS and that kind of thing sort of popped up just in time to give us this other reason to be scared uh, about sex. And now, like in the aftermath of that, yeah, it's like they're all dealing with this anxiety of like, we don't like, we know we need to teach the kids something about sex and they need to take it seriously and they can't just be doing it willy nilly. But yeah, it's like, they're all dealing with that weird uh, sort of like gray area that I think that time, like the eighties and nineties was kind of steeped in of yeah. like, uh, you know, the, uh, what the, like, what's, what is this? What is the sixties? The summer of love and all that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is over. The stuffy religious times are over. Like we don't, we don't know what it is anymore. One of the things that this whole exercise has made me curious about though, is how did leave it to beaver handle this? Well, you know, they didn't. they didn't like we, we went to look for a Brady bunch or some type well, of other of all, episode. You, where... you couldn't show people sleeping in a bed together yeah, or no. imply it until, I don't even know when. You know, where can we trace back to? Was it the 70s, like, after school specials that kind of allowed TV to, to start talking about teenagers and young adults having sex? For some reason, I think family ties. I keep going back to that as I bet that would be one of the first things to have something like that. Yeah, maybe. Okay, so that does it for Losing Our Virginity. Our topic next week is going to be Twins and Doppelgangers. TV episodes where an actor gets to put on a wig or do a funny accent and be a different character that looks just like the character they usually play. Okay, so starting in the 60s, we have Bewitched, season three, episode 18, and then there were three. And then we have I Dream of Jeannie, season five, episode 12, My Sister the Homewrecker. We have All in the Family, season nine, episode 15, A Girl Like Edith. Third Rock from the Sun, which is the three-episode arc. It starts with the last episode of season one and then the season premiere and episode two of season two. And that's Sea Dick Run, Sea Dick Continue to Run, and Sea Dick Continue to Run Continued. And finally, we wrapped it up with Friends, season two, episode 10, The One with Russ. All right, so that's next week. And until then, we will declare this phase of the sitcom study concluded.
Thank you for listening to the sitcom study. Tell us what you think or share your own TV tropes and topic ideas by sending a self-addressed stamped email to sitcomstudypodcast at gmail.com or find us on Facebook or Instagram. And if you like the show, consider leaving a rating or review on your podcast app. It helps us boost those precious Nielsen ratings. The sitcom study is recorded in front of a live studio dog. Thank you.